Welcome viewers to the Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital. My name is Heather Horn. I'm a deputy editor at The New Republic, and I'm here with Eva Orner, who is an Australian director and producer based in LA. Uh, we're here to talk about her 2021 film, Burning. Um, so Eva, thank you so much for making the time to chat today. Um, very excited to talk about this thought-provoking film. So this film is about the 2019 to 2020 Australian bushfires. Um, this unprecedented disaster, which is estimated, I think, to have burned well over 60 million acres. Some estimates are much higher. Um, and one thing that's interesting to me is that the film opens well before those fires, looking at, in one part, the global youth climate movement that has been trying to get politicians, including in Australia, to enact serious climate policy. So what follows is then presented very much as a failure to respond to these earlier calls for change. And because of that, I'm really curious um, about the genesis of this film, particularly when the original idea came around um, and sort of how you started to develop this idea. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been living in the States since 2004, but I'm very proudly still Australian. And um, I mean, I was watching the fires start in 2019 and they started in August. And I remember being at home in LA, seeing on like CNN, the, the fires had started in Australia in August. And I remember saying to my boyfriend, yeah, it's winter. It's not even spring. <laughs> this is weird. Like the fires usually start October, November, and you know, October's even early. I mean, it's a bit like California, they're usually towards the end of summer when everything's really dry. So this was this was a bit of a disaster. And I knew that it had been incredibly dry and hot and getting that way. And so, you know, by October, November, I was seeing images of Sydney shrouded in smoke that we'd never seen before. And I actually, I usually go home at Christmas to see family and friends. And we flew into it. And I spent a month there in December, January. Um, and I just watched, you know, the entire country, it felt like, was on fire. And we grew up with bushfires. We know what it's like. But this was beyond next level. This was so unprecedented in scale. It affected one in four Australians. By the time I got on a flight home to LA, I was kind of thinking, I think there could be a film here. And one of the really interesting climate change things that hit me was I'm from Melbourne. And on December 27, 2019, I was in Melbourne and it was 47 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, well, well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, when I grew up 34 years in Melbourne, it never got over 34 degrees, uh, sorry, 40, 44 degrees, which was maybe a week in February. And this was December and it was 47 degrees. And so, you know, anecdotally, that's like a three degree climate increase the temperature increase in my hometown in my lifetime and that freaked me out yeah so it was interesting to see um you did incorporate that historical perspective very very much into the film about you know people who have seen this play out over several generations talking about their parents experiences their experiences and so forth um i'm curious uh I'm curious a little bit, because you also talk about the resistance to calls for change, uh, which is extremely strong in Australia, as it is, it must be said, in the United States. I'm curious, as you develop this film, who your intended audience was, who you want to have see this film. Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of films like this that are, you know, about the refugee crisis or, you know, about an issue that may not be necessarily the most popular or embraced issue with audiences, but it's incredibly important to tell the story, I think, to bear witness on history, but also in a way to educate people. And I always think in terms of audiences, you know, it's so easy to say you're preaching to the converted, which you are, you know, a big part of the audience is going to be left-wing people who believe in climate change. But in my head, in most countries, you know, there's 40% on one side, 40% on another side. They're never going to change, no matter what you do. It's very rare for them to change. And there's this kind of middle ground of like 20% of the population and whether whether they're young, you know, new voters, whether they're ill-informed, confused, or just kind of, you know, not interested. I feel like that's who you really want to see the film because if you get them, that can make all the difference. Because as we can see in most countries like America and Australia, the elections are getting closer and closer as the countries are getting more and more divided. Um, so I think that's kind of who you really want. And I also feel like, you know, young audiences are really important for this. I think kids need to see this film because they're going to be voting. And this is about the, the, the planet that we've left them um, that's going to be their future. So that's kind of who I think should watch this film. But I feel like with climate change, everyone needs to see everything about climate change at the minute because it's really the most pressing issue of our time. 
Yeah, so looking at that sort of persuadable middle slash people who care but might be a little bit checked out, that makes... Yeah, um, and people who just don't know or who are confused, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you do mention, um, you know, young people who have a lot at stake here. I'm curious as to how you thought about and went about incorporating those younger voices, because obviously there is a character in this film who um, is a youth activist. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I was looking at the main characters in the film, you know, I have like a career firefighter who's been doing this for years, and we kind of tell the historical story through his story. I have one of Australia and also the world's, you know, preeminent um, climate scientist, Tim Flannery, in the film. You know, there's, there's there's a lot of different people in the film who are really, really strong, a lot of people who are affected by the fires. But one of the voices I really wanted was, you know, I call her like, you know, Al Greta. Um, and her name's Davy Jeff- Daisy Jeffries, and she's a young climate activist who was one of the leaders of the student strikes in Australia, inspired by Greta. And I think it's really interesting because she is she's actually now about 18, 19, doing her first year of um, university. But her last two years of high school were consumed from the age of like 15, 16 to when she finished high school. She was one of the heads of this huge movement where they got hundreds of thousands of people protesting on the streets. And she's got a really... She's just a really interesting character. She's really, I think she's really refreshing. And there's so many things she brings to the film. And I talked to her about the responsibility that we have put on young people because of the mess that we've left them. And she's really great at talking about, you know, the fact that she should just be a kid, you know, she should just be having existential crises every day and trying to get her schoolwork done. Meanwhile, she's trying to save the planet. And I hadn't really heard someone young talk about it like that. And there's another great moment where I ask her, you can hear me off camera saying, you know, are you mad at us? You know, are you mad at the older generation? And it's really funny. She says, I'm not mad at you. And I kind of took a wound going, oh my God, I'm old. <laughs> but, you know, she's she's really kind of, in a funny way, she's kind of half mad, half zen, you know, half really practical, half incredibly emotional. Um, but I just, so many people, so many older people say, the younger generation are going to save us. It's their, you know, it's their job to fix the planet. And I think it's the most awful legacy that we've gifted to this young generation. And I thought it was really refreshing to have her maybe mention that and say, you know, this isn't what we signed up for. So another theme um, that I was picking up when I was watching this film is there's this... (laughs) It's a scene that sort of weaves in and out throughout the film, the presence of Aboriginal communities um, and stewardship of Australia, a story that's obviously fraught with colonial violence and exploitation, but also has a lot of environmental lessons um, and that Indigenous fire control techniques are getting a lot of credit for their efficacy in the past couple of years, which is a long overdue um, process. But can you talk a little bit about how you thought about incorporating Aboriginal voices and history in this film? Yeah, this is a this is a real and and it's a little similar to the last question in a lot of ways. I mean, I actually plan to have a lot more in the film about you know cultural burning, which is indigenous burning practices, because that's how they manage the land successfully for hundreds of years. And it's so cynical. It's this very white man cynical thing. You know, Australia has one of the worst histories and track records of our treatment of Indigenous people. There was massive genocide and, you know, taking away children and essentially eugenics, you know, trying to breed them out. I mean, Australia has the most appalling history with Indigenous people. And then, you know, when the shit hits the fan, what do cynical governments do? Call in the Indigenous people to try and solve a situation that we have created. Climate change is a white man's creation. It is not an Indigenous creation. Cultural burning is amazing in terms of, you know, they would look at the landscape, look at what was blooming, look at what was happening and burn in the right times in a very controlled way. The problem is it's not that landscape anymore. And so everyone that I would talk to would say, it's great and the government is cynically throwing tonnes of money into this, but it's too hot too dry the landscapes have changed so it's not as effective as it used to be and so I didn't want it to be like oh cultural burning is going to save us because it it's a bigger problem than that now and cultural burning could have saved us if it was used over the last 50 years but it wasn't because we didn't respect Aboriginal land practices so I've sort of got you know the film starts with an uh, with a traditional ceremony at the student protest, an Indigenous ceremony, which is really beautiful and kind of evocative. And then we have um, we have one of the leading um, 
Bruce Pascoe, one of the leading writers and kind of Indigenous thinkers in the country talking about it. And he's really lovely because he's super poetic. He's faced so much in his life and he's quite optimistic at the end of the film. You know, he does have hope, but he's also very clear on what's realistic and what's not. And I think it's very important not to oversimplify, you know, that it's a little bit like, oh, you know, the kids are going to save us, the Indigenous people are going to save us. And it's like, yeah, our, you know, our middle-aged white government you know predominantly male governments who have messed everything up historically need to take some responsibility and you know we have an election coming in the next couple of months um and it's really up to australians to you know to vote them out and we'll see if that happens yeah and um that it's an interesting segue to another question that i wanted to ask um because it gets at sort of the the deep complexity of of these topics i mean i think um you know, dealing with a topic like this that has you know, so so many potential characters and facts and um, potential heroes or villains and everything in between, it sometimes feels like there's no one piece or film or story that can possibly do it justice. I mean, I know in editing at the New Republic, you know, even looking back over a total number of stories for a year, I'm like, oh, wow, I wish we'd hit that topic a little more. I wish we'd like covered this a bit better. Um, I wish we'd gotten to that story. Um, I'm curious, um, with the benefit of perspective from having completed the film, whether either, whether there are things that you would do differently if you did it again, or whether there is some topic in environmental film that you wish someone would make a film about? Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question, wow. It is a hard question, but I'm curious just to hear your thoughts. I mean, I think, I think with filmmaking, you know, you make a film, you try and do the best you can under so many weird situations. I mean, this one was a COVID film. So, you know, I did all the research and all the pre-interviewing from LA via Zoom. You know, I, I met the characters in the film for the first time, generally the day we were filming. You know, we were working against border restrictions you know, it was kind of like making any film early on in COVID was kind of a miracle. So I think, you know, I'm so grateful we just got to even make it. Um, I think, you know, the day you think your film is perfect or even good, you know, you should stop making films. I've been doing this for 25 years. So, you know, when I watch films, I'm always cringing and, you know, I'm always looking at what we could have done differently. And also I know what all the weaknesses are um, and where the strengths are. I mean, I don't know. I look. I, I, at the end of the day, I think it's had a really good re response and reaction. I think it's really important. I kind of stand by it in terms of what it's about. I think probably most of my thoughts, you know, critical thoughts on it would be more creative. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's so weird. Like last week, they just announced in Australia that koalas are now on the endangered list. I'm sure you saw that. And so, you know, if people say sometimes maybe it's too didactic or it's too forceful or something, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't think it's forceful enough. You know, the Great Barrier Reef is going to be gone by 2050. That's pretty much conclusive scientific fact at the minute. You know, the government just threw like $40 million to try and save the reef last week. But we've known this has been happening for the last 20 years and nothing's been done about it as the, the, the temperature of the water rises. And we've known that koalas are in really you know in massive jeopardy and to me to me it's just it's i'm still in shock from the announcement last week that kang that koalas are on the endangered species list i mean you think of australia you think of koalas i think the whole world should be up in arms about this and it's sort of like i i just i don't think you can scream and shout enough about climate change and about how little governments are currently doing and one of one of the things that was really interesting was we got to show the film at um at Glasgow at the COP in um, mm -hmm. in uh, November, we went out and showed the film there. And, you know, people at the COP, you know, this is the UN Climate Conference. Um, I'm sure DC audiences know about that. But, you know, it's full of policy wonks and politicians and their jobs. Their job is to be optimistic. You know, how do you survive in that world if you're not an optimist? And I'm a realist. I'm not a pessimist, but I'm a realist. And it was funny, a lot of people there were calling me a pessimist um, because I was just kind of calling out you know, the result of the conference, I mean, it was so disappointing. It was really heralded as the last chance for world leaders to come together and do something major. And they didn't make commitments that were strong enough. So to me, this is the most alarming issue that we're dealing with at the minute. I think everything else pales in comparison. Um, and so I just think there can't be enough of this kind of alarmist, um, you know, storytelling going on about climate change. 
Yeah, well, it is worth mentioning uh, for viewers of this interview that actually um, koalas are featured in the film. And in fact, some of the footage that is most disturbing does involve um, a koala during the during the fires. So that actually did strike me while watching this over the weekend that it, it seems prescient given the recent news. Um, but um, yeah, so given that this is um, a film festival that is anchored in um, DC in the US Capitol, I'm also wondering whether there are particular things that you'd like for uh, American residents to keep in mind when watching this film? Because it did come across to me as very, um, very easy for an American audience to consume, but I didn't know if there are certain aspects that you would really want Americans to keep in mind when watching or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things. I think the film, you know, the film is very much set in Australia, but towards the end, we open up to comparisons around the world. And I think it's a warning that, you know, Australia is really ground zero for climate change. It's a very vulnerable country to climate change. It's hot and dry. It's like 90% desert. So we were always going to cop it the worst first. You know, that was scientifically on the cards for a long time. But I think one of the big warnings of the film is, yeah, this is coming to you if it's not already there now. I mean, I tend to have bad luck in the places I live. Like now I live in California. <laughs> so, you know, I'm in bush. I mean, you know, I'm in fire central here as well. I always say don't live where I live. Clearly <laughs> I have bad decision-making abilities. But, you know, it's happening in Europe. It's happening in the Amazon. It's happening. We, we premiered the film at Toronto Film Festival last uh, September. And the audience were asking a lot of questions because they were in the middle of the worst fire season that ever had. And Canada's a cold climate country. So there's no escaping this. And if it's not fire, it's flood or it's weather unpredictability or it's, you know, you know, the hurricanes or the cyclones. So to me, this is a really big warning that no one can escape this. I think that's probably the strongest warning. And I think the other thing is really showing government incompetence and the fact that we let governments get away with this. And we're seeing that in America, we're seeing that everywhere. But to me, one of the biggest messages of the film is, you know, when we vote, climate change should be our number one issue. And I think we're a really long way for that. And we really have to get away from, you know, the economy or whatever else we vote for being our number one issue, because if we don't do something incredibly um, radical in the next decade for climate change, everything else is going to be not important. Yeah, so that um, is also a good segue into the question I wanted to close with, which is the question I think that your film uh, closes with, which is about the balance between the kind of pessimism necessary to uh, induce action, but how to balance that with also a sense of hope so it isn't a sense of defeatism, which can also inhibit action. And I'm wondering, um, for you, given that you've worked on this topic, obviously, a lot over the past couple of years, how you think about that balance, whether in your personal life or whether, you know, in, in um, how to talk about that balance in the film. I mean, I always look to really smart, successful people, you know, who work in this space and how they deal with it. And they are all really optimistic. And I was very aware when I made the film and also when I sold the film, you know, when I was pitching it, it was the beginning of COVID and I kind of had the foresight to know that the next few years, which is where we are now, we're going to be really rough on the global community because of the pandemic. And I thought, you know, people aren't going to be, want to watch like, you know, this horror show film. Um, and so, you know, in the third act, we kind of skewer quite a lot into hope. And, you know, we have Mike Cannon Brooks, who's like Australia's Elon Musk, this tech, young tech billionaire who's doing all this amazing technology. And he thinks, you know, we, he thinks we can fix this. He, we, he believes we have the technology and the science know-how to fix climate change. It's just a matter of doing it. And when the government is letting you down, you have to do it yourself. And so I think probably the biggest thing that I learned and I believe in a lot is, you know, and I'm, we're seeing this in action globally, is that when governments more and more don't, you know, don't reflect what communities need, you see people acting on their own, whether it's individually, you know, whether they're buying, you know, putting solar on their houses and getting batteries and driving electric cars to communities where they're having community projects, you know, to local and local and state governments and also to entrepreneurs. And so, you know, Mike Cannon Brooks' theory is, you know, it's a bit like if we build it, they will come, they being the government. And so he's like, don't let the government wear you down on this, keep fighting and they will eventually come around because if they don't, we will vote them out. And so I think that's probably the most optimistic way to look at, to look at these issues. Um, do I think we're in really big trouble? Yes. You know, I think the COP kind of knocked me down a lot seeing the fact that we just can't agree on anything. I think, you know, Biden's climate 
climate plan is being knocked down by a couple of rogue uh, you know, members of members of government, but you know, you just have to keep fighting. I mean, we've got to win this, otherwise, you know, losing is losing is beyond contemplation. I think at this point. All right. Well, thank you so much for making the time to chat today. Um, thank you to the viewers, of the film festival. I think we'll leave it there. Thanks so much. <laughs>